Hello everybody, welcome to uh, episode 6 of Fundamentals of Research in Medicine with Professor Dr. Fikri Abuzidan. Uh, hi Prof, welcome again. Oh, yeah. And yes. uh, in our last episode we discussed about uh, designing a research project, some uh, the simple advices actually you gave to the medical students. Uh, now in this episode we want to you know, learn uh, more about the mistakes that researchers do when they design a study. Yeah, I think uh, I think also this will be like a sum up of what we've been discussing in the last five uh, talks. And uh, the, the, the actually the more serious two uh, mistakes people do, the first one is not really knowing what they want to do. <laughs> And that's not really having a clear uh, research. So you mean actually there is no clear question in there? Yes, mind? of course. Yeah, sometimes students come to me. I want to study, let's say, acute cholecystitis. So what are you going to study with acute cholecystitis? It's, it's a very broad aim and it's not precise. Uh, or, oh, I like to study mesenteric ischemia. So what do you want to study? You want the diagnosis, the management, the outcome, uh, the intervention of radiology. So that's because this will reflect on the design art. So first of all, you should have a precise aim. And then the commonest mistake, which is unrepairable, is that your methods don't fit your question. That means your design or protocol or uh, does not answer the question. And in this way, some people may spend a long time collecting the data. And then they say, oh, I'm going to, to, uh, to answer such a question. But you've not been collecting the data to answer that question. So it's very important, very important that the research design should answer the research question. I was in an international conference and there were about six people and they were studying the effect of CRP in diagnosing acute appendicitis. And then I looked to the study, it was really a big conference and all the patients has acute appendicitis. So I stood up and they said, please, I mean, if you are studying the diagnosis of acute appendicitis, all your C group has acute appendicitis. So what's the value of CRP? And believe me, all the 600 started shouting. They didn't accept what I'm saying. And then after the session, they could understand. I'm telling, oh, you were right. And then you're sorry, you understand. What is the, the importance of that? The importance if you are going, let's say, to do a diagnostic study, you have really to diagnose not to select the diagnosed and then study, study the only. variables. That's yeah. not the real scenario. It's actually, this is an artificial scenario. Try to be normal. The other thing, of course, is that a common pe mistake people do. Let's say you are doing a diagnostic study. They don't define their gold standard. Let's say I want to say this is cancer. So how did you say it's cancer? Is it a histopathology? It's an impression. The issue is that you need a gold standard, whether it's a laparotomy, whether it's a CT scan, of course, CT scan is not perfect, but you may say my gold standard is CT scan. CT scan. Yeah, you, so you have to choose a gold standard. And many of the times I see a uh, diagnostic study without defining the gold standard. So if you want to listen to this word, gold standard. So how can you say this is gold or silver if you don't have uh, something to compare with? And the other mistake I really, uh, annoys me a lot, and this is also, I, I want you really to, to, to understand this point, is that the, the person who usually knows what is a cause and what's an effect, usually they are clinicians, because the numbers are there. But who knows the relationship between these numbers? This may look strange, but I, I've reviewed some papers like that, people predicting bleeding from death, which means they reverse it. People don't die and then they bleed. They bleed and then die. So defining your independent and dependent factors are really very important. A causes B, but B doesn't cause A. Who will understand that? It's the clinician. And that's why many people, I notice in their mistakes in the design, they do a lot of the analysis running for a p-value. And personally, you remember, Arif, once you came for me with an educational paper with a lot of analysis, and I told you, Arif, we don't need the analysis. <laughs> Throw all the, you remember that? Yeah, yeah, we actually, took off yeah, the whole statistics. Off the all the analysis, actually. Yeah. And the paper was accepted it was directly. But at the end, it ended up with, you know, published but, in uh, medical education. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. a good journal. So, I mean, 
the aim, I mean, the methods you use should fit the aim. Statistics is just a, is a method to fit an aim. If it's a descriptive study, it's a descriptive study. If it's a comparative study, yes. If you have two groups to compare, then you do comparative statistics. Well, if you really have a, a group of patients that really you, you want to describe a specific outcome, you can do that without even comparison. I mean, uh, of course, comparative studies, they look more fancy and have better chance to, to be published. But in principle, the, the methods should fit the, uh, the, 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 the aim of the study. That is the, the other commonest mistake I found. People don't understand the difference between dependent and independent factor. Death will depend on the amount of bleeding or on the blood pressure. But blood pressure does not depend on death. death. <laughs> there is no blood pressure at all, zero. You cannot say so. That is that's although it looks very simple, Harry, but you can you will be surprised to see how people don't think about these basic things. So, again, just to summarize, please be precise in your research question. Please think about the methods, do they answer your question? These are common things. And the other thing, don't overdo statistics. Statistics is just an A, it's not an aim per se, it is just a tool, so, and don't overdo things, and we will speak about errors in statistics yeah. later on. Maybe we have another episode. And think about your design before you do the study. I want to stress here that also one of the errors people try to do, the, the study is not feasible. For example, people want to do randomized control study in developing countries and they don't have the culture. Yeah. So you are sure that there will be no concealment. They are sure there will be no randomization. You are sure there will be manipulation. So the study is not actually achievable. It's not feasible. So you have to know, okay, you want to, to build a sky tower. You don't have the facility to do it. Why do it? It's better to have a proper tent that protects you from the sun with a nice wind through it and you enjoy yeah. your proper... Uh, so using the resources logically. <laughs> logically, yes. Yeah. And uh, you will be surprised. I'll just give two examples. There are two studies in the literature trying to, to use a mosquito mesh for hernia. You know, this very expensive, uh, expensive uh, mesh you put them for the hernia. They use the mosquito tent <laughs> and it's the same result as the manufacturer. The other one is also uh, a very interesting study by uh, Professor Ancelloni from Italy. Uh, he, tri he developed a, w a very simple method of suction of blood in the poor countries to, to really to transfuse the blood, retransfuse the blood. So you have to be innovative in your thinking. You have to live at what you live. Don't really look too much. Grow slowly. You're capable of doing research. These researchers in a developing country did their prospective randomized control trial using the mosquito net. Please go to the midline and read it. So, and that's by the way called disruptive technology, which means you bring new ideas that the companies do not like, but I assume the students are the clever people, they are the energetic people, but please learn the methodology. Don't make mistakes and ask for advice. Uh, uh when you are talking actually that I think it should be definitely in the methodology and planning uh, the, uh, I, I the, a couple of my experience actually when I reviewing some papers uh, you're reading the methodology the study is already done but there is no mention about the ethical approval or nothing yeah that's right uh, do you think it is a you know the mistake actually oh, the recently yeah, actually maybe decreased uh, because there is a good control of the, it's, a, uh, it's a major mistake I'm, I'm really I you know <laughs> if you are working in research you think you assume it's an assumption so of course if your study is non-ethical no one will publish it and now it's very good that the journals start to uh, insist to have availability of data and you've seen this uh, repeatedly in different journals that the data should be available to be checked yeah. and it should be to a high standard and I can tell you one of the lessons I learned we have to respect ethics we have to respect the rules and we are in a learning process I remember about uh, 40 years ago we used to do our retrospective studies because anonymous we practice ethically uh, but uh, we didn't need uh, an ethical approval, and many of the countries now. For, right. But now, uh, yeah. uh, not all countries now. We do some prospective studies. Some countries, 
for anonymous data, they consider it another, they don't ask any ethical approval. For example, photographing the patient. Before, I used to a lot of photographs, we call it oral consent. Yeah. Now, I don't take a picture of any patient without a, written consent. without a form which is in my bag, always, because some of the images you will see them one in your life. Yeah. So I don't want to miss that. So my camera is on my side yeah. and my consent is in my bag. You have really to take a special the same permission. Thing for the study, actually, and you complete the whole study in the lab or in the clinical environment, whatever it is, one year, two years, but if there is no ethical. You yeah, know, yeah. just to stress so. this, Arif, also, uh, I have seen a very beautiful random mass control trial in this city that was not published in high-ranked journals because it was not registered in yeah. the in the trial, uh, uh, clinical yeah. trial registry. So you have to follow the principles. You know, the time is short to go for that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have proper ethical approval. You should have proper registration. It's even better to publish your protocol before you get the full study because people will come and critique your protocol will give you advice and you can improve and you can improve before collecting the data yeah. so we are we are learning but of course we don't want you to learn the hard way we want yeah. you to learn the proper way we had the, our our own lessons we learned the hard way we yeah. want life easier for you okay <laughs> thank you very much thank you very thank much, you very much. Good thank you thank you very much.